Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Adria Vassal and I am the managing editor of Corporate Nights Magazine. I am in Toronto, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Thank you for joining us at the Mars Climate Impact Conference for this fireside chat. Is the carbon bubble starting to burst? I'd uh, like to welcome our special guest today, Mark Campanelli. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Adria. Just to, give, to be here. Yeah, so great to have you here. Uh, just to give our audience a bit of a background on you if they're not already familiar with you. Uh, following a career in asset management, Mark founded and now chairs the Carbon Tracker Initiative, a nonprofit focused on aligning the fossil fuel industry with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. More recently, Mark co-founded Planet Tracker and Industry Tracker, which look at the challenges of corporate sustainability through the lens of natural capital. So be sure to check those out. Mark is a co-founder as well of some of the very first responsible investment funds. Uh, so Mark, I mean, you've been at this for quite a long time. And uh, in fact, you first coined the Stranded Assets Thesis in 2011, good 10 years ago now, uh, in a report called Unburnable Carbon. Are the world's financial markets carrying a carbon bubble? Now, before we dive into all this, for those who are a little fuzzy on the concept, do you mind just defining carbon bubble for us? Yeah, let's make it, let's make it really easy. Um, the maths is quite straightforward. We took the world's top 200 listed coal, oil and gas companies. We worked out how much carbon dioxide which is the principal global warming gas, um, is held in the reserves and the resources of these co co companies, added it all up and then worked out if you were to release and burn all of that, how many degrees of warming would it take you to? And the answer is it takes you to about four or five degrees of warming. And as the science really tells us, most of that fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. So there's a hole at the heart of the business models of the fossil fuel majors, the coal producers and the oil companies. They can't produce what they own. And they certainly, we certainly can't burn it. Now that could have financial consequences as well. So if most of those fossil fuels have to stay in the ground um, and there's a hole at the heart of the business models of Exxon and Suncor and Shell and BP and Glencore and all of the others, does that translate uh, financially? And um, now we said it was a carbon bubble. It's a huge carbon overhang, far too much carbon. Is it a financial bubble? And since the report was published, um, over 10 years ago now, um, the fossil fuel sector has hugely underperformed the S&P 500. It's been a really volatile ride for any shareholder in oil and gas. And, and the oil companies and the coal companies have suffered really as, as investor sentiment uh, because of this sort of stranded assets idea. Investor sentiment towards the whole sector has completely changed, certainly in Europe um, and many in the East Coast and the West Coast of North America. And so... Yeah, so that's that's the carbon bubble. What we didn't say was going to blow up overnight and, and fall apart, but certainly um, if there is a dramatic intervention by governments because of runaway um, global heating, then, then, then surely any shareholder owning these companies is, is really going to face a rough, rough ride for, for sure, even more than what we've seen in the last five, 10 years. Exactly 10 years ago from when you coined that uh, thesis and, and put up that initial report. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has now in the last week alone put out two articles, uh, trillions in assets may be left stranded as companies address climate change was one headline and another headline a few days ago, Wall Street's $22 trillion carbon time bomb. How do you, yeah. do you feel like your warnings are, are finally being heard? It's 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 a great it's great when the Wall Street Journal ca catches up on what the Financial Times has been saying for the last decade. But it's great the Wall Street Journal's got there, and um, their analysis is exactly the same as our own. Uh, and uh, I don't know if the uh, the story came up on the screen, but they say that trillions of dollars of assets are going to have to be written down. Carbon Tracker, we estimate that there's around um, twenty to thirty trillion dollars of the fossil fuel system made up of the producers of fossil fuels and then the fixed assets of the system, the coal-fired power stations, the pipelines, the oil rigs, 
all, all the paraphernalia associated with the use of fossil fuels. Um, we reckon it's about a quarter of the value of equity markets and around half of non-bank corporate bonds is linked to the fossil fuel system. If you think about it, shipping, cement, steel, aviation, power, transportation, and we're gonna to have to decarbonize that in the, in the next decade. We're gonna to have to reduce emissions by 50% in the next decade. We can decarbonize a little bit longer, but the fundamental shift uh, happens from now uh, over the next decade. And, um, um, you know, investors who signed GFANS, I, I was there in Glasgow, the COP for the launch of the Glasgow right. Finance Alliance for Net Zero. Um, I'm, I'm on the advisory council of, of GFANS. It's, um, it's a $130 trillion global coalition of investors and banks committed to achieving net zero by 2050, all trying to figure out how to decarbonize. And, and central to that is how do we turn over um, the, the, the economy without, without dismantling it um, and disrupting it at the same time? How do we just turn over, re-engineer it, rebuild it uh, in a low carbon way? without pension fund investors and, and banks suffering too much. We will uh, drill down into uh, the role of banks in a moment. Yeah. But I uh, wanted to check in with you about, you know, the surge in oil, the oil prices that we're reading about now, uh, just yeah. a few hours ago, saw a piece sure. on projections that they go up to $150 uh, a barrel. And, uh, you know, some are calling this a carbon bonanza more than a carbon bubble. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, there has clearly been a, a supply squeeze linked to COVID, but also linked to um, a change in sentiment towards fossil fuels. And in the transition, there's always going to be ups and downs. And, and it's only a fool that predicts the oil price. Um, Fatih Birol, who's the uh, executive director of the International Energy Agency, in the last couple of weeks, he said two things. The first is that the world needs no more new investment in coal, oil, and gas. It's the right. IEA net zero 1.5 degree scenario. If we're serious about 1.5, and we have to be, we've not seen two degrees of warming for, for you know three, four million years. We haven't had that level of warming in that time period. Um, and we've got the highest concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere for 800,000 years. We're creating the conditions for runaway climate change, uh, we're close to 1.5 already. So if he said we're serious about 1.5, and the science tells us that we're code red, that we don't need any new investment. This is the IA. Now, the second thing he said, I think it was yesterday, is that the blame for these high prices lies fair and square with the producers of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the problem of the renewable energy, um, the people building the renewable energy system. We obviously have to accelerate the pace. And uh, those who are as keen on the media uh, as I am about looking at what's happening on renewable energy, uh, the IEA published today their, their latest analysis of the build out of renewables. And most of the new infrastructure being built today in energy is in renewables. And the reason for that is because it's cheaper than fossil fuels. People are building out really rapidly, particularly wind and solar, um, at cheaper rates than fossil fuels. As, and so you've got this mismatch. How quickly can we build it to, to meet the supply that we know uh, we need for energy? And, and can we resolve some of the challenging ones? And the, the one at the moment, as we hit winter in Europe, certainly in North America, is uh, heating. Can we, can we heat without burning fossil gas? Yes. Um, and so can we, get the, can we get the energy leap from that we've seen in other technology changes? So you remember when a laptop used to cost, well, $2,000, it is now $200. Right. Um, ground source heat pumps, certainly in the United Kingdom, to install one today in Sterling is around 8,000. But can we imagine that that drops like you've seen with gas boilers and you've seen the technology drops for other things, like whether it's flat screens or iPhones or, 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 lapt or, or laptops, whatever it is, we know technology costs drop. Um, and that's what we need to do in heating as well and uh, pick up the, the shortfall. So, so I, I, I completely accept that there's been a, 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 um, a, a rise in the last six months and you've seen this in the rise of share prices, but do I think it can be sustained? It can't be. And, and the reason for that very simply is, is the uh, price competitiveness of renewables versus fossil fuels. I mean, I, just to explain a little bit, if you think about it, fossil fuels by their nature are inherently inflationary. 
to go and find it. You having all the cheap stuff has been found. You have to go to difficult places um, to find the the oil, and it's more expensive to extract if you go into the Arctic, ultra deep water, or or in the case of Canada, you've got this. You're into blowing up things and mining and, and creating <laughs> landscapes like Mordor, and you think that that's yeah. normal. I don't know what's going on in Canada, but that's your thing, isn't it? Um, but it's expensive to produce. Now the opposite is, and then you have to then you have to heat it to refine it and then get it across the the ocean if you're exporting it and if it's lng you have to compress it it's really expensive and if you think about renewables it's the reverse mm. um, it's just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to find the technologies are on steep learning curves every doubling in production 20 percent cut in price um and um and you can use it at the you can extract the sunlight or the wind pretty much close to where you want to use it and it's right. inherently deflationary and so that's the problem with fossil fuels. It's going to get killed by the economics. At the same time, we're starting to see a bit of a fossil fuel fire sale, aren't we? Uh, some some uh, producers are looking at getting some of their dirtier assets off their books and uh, looking into putting them on the market. But does that really help us if uh, we're just transferring ownership to other companies? Uh, I, I completely agree company, with you. Right? Cleaning up their I books, perhaps. Agree. Yeah, you're right. It's a problem, and um, uh, offloading your your high carbon assets just as to another owner it doesn't solve the climate problem. Um, and we have a, I mean, clearly the climate change is not isolated to one company or even one country. It's a global problem, and the uh, the conference of the parties, the COP, the one, the twenty sixth one that we had in Glasgow, was the one for the very very first time. Can you imagine it? The first conference of the parties that allowed to to have the words fossil fuels and coal in the final communique, wow. uh, because the previous twenty five, you're not allowed to talk about fossil fuels. And and if if anyone knows this, the Paris Agreement when it was signed doesn't mention fossil fuels anywhere in it. So the COP communique mentions coal, phasing down coal, the first time it's been mentioned. Um, and what I think we need is a grown-up discussion about how we get the world off fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And at, also at Glasgow, and I was there for it, um, there was a, a bum fight to try and get into the launch room because so many people tried to get in, was the launch of BOGA, the Beyond um, Oil and Gas Alliance, which was uh, Costa Rica, Denmark, Greenland, uh, Iceland, California, which is not a country, might, but might just as well be, and about right. you know, a dozen in total. Um, to permanently cancel oil and gas exploration. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that Norway yesterday announced that it was not going to issue any new licenses in this calendar year. So we need countries to give up production rights and cancel them for coal, oil and gas. And that's why I'm a supporter of a terrific initiative led by or chaired by a Canadian uh, Zipporah Berman, which is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the idea then is to get countries to agree and negotiate is what the cops should have agreed in the first place 25 years ago but we just right. took the wrong turn today we can now talk about um the changing landscape of the supply of fossil fuels and i chair a project called the global registry of fossil fuels which is a sister project to the the, the treaty fossilfueltreaty.org and the global registry is a mapping who's got the fossil fuels and a high cost and low cost and where it's in environmentally vulnerable sites areas to to give up the production um, to get us back in line because we're, we're in the middle of a huge expansion phase for fossil fuels mm. uh, under through the banking system um and uh which we think is misplaced because of the economics that we've just been talking about um but um, we need to get countries and companies to realize that you that um uh, it's a mistake to think that you can be last last man standing. I think the Canadians rather fancy themselves, along with the Saudis, to be last country standing. But um, I, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be such a great hope, certainly not for 2030 and 2040. Speaking of Canada, what is the end game for Canadian oil companies if we want them to start cutting production? Should they be you know, winding down, cashing out? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, burning as fast as possible, raising capital for carbon capture uh, and storage. What, what, yeah, what's your well, um, suggestion? Putin is the Russians. He's been really clever. He he. Re I think he realizes the writing is on the wall by constraining supply in gas. Is forcing prices up. 
Mm. And uh, Luke Oil and Rosneft and Gazprom are getting these super bumper dividends, which, of course, go to the Kremlin. And that's what happens in a world uh, of fossil fuels. Very few suppliers, uh, many, many users. You've got almost a monopoly control. Um, and the Saudis, of course, have been offloading Saudi Aramco by, by selling shares in it because uh, they realize they've got to cash out before, um, before the world really does get off of fossil fuels. Canada... You know, they, they, they have to think about how they play this one out. Um, I suspect that um, they should have made, or I know parts of it are making this huge, as we've heard from the, the Mars Impact Conference, this big shift into renewables and clean technology. So I support the, the cash out and run down. Don't invest in anything new. Keep the supply going as you run down and use the, the cash to pay out how at high dividends or to do share buybacks. Um, and if you're smart enough to maybe build a renewables division, but so many, so few have done this. And uh, mm. I, um, uh, I just wonder really what's going through the board. So, I mean, the big thing that we talk about right now, certainly in London, is the attack on the board on the on the board of Shell by Dan Loeb, the hedge fund. Right. His board was a nearly a billion dollars worth of Shell, and he's trying to break up the company, splitting it into a, a legacy rundown company. And then a growth company doing things like hydrogen and distribution and so on. And I, I think that's probably probably the way to go, actually. Hmm. I'd like to get back to the role of banks and all this. Uh, you yeah. know, in Canada, they've certainly been at the center of uh, some conversations and heated arguments uh, about uh, the role of banks in, in continuing to finance uh, fossil fuel expansion. Obviously, many of our banks have now signed on with Mark Carney um, and his initiative. Uh, yeah. Of course, we've heard many promises over the years from a lot of different industries about uh, meeting next net zero. How do you feel about this particular push? And uh, is there a kind of a single thing that our, our central banks could be doing to drive this over the edge? Yeah, I mean, I mean, all those banks that have signed up to net zero, it's it's clearly it's a journey and people are going to travel together in quite a big group, which is why the banks are traveling together. Um, and they're not all going at the same pace, that's clear, but it's a direction that's important. And that's why the 130 trillion is such a significant number. Uh, now, at the same time, we have to recognize that you can't be on a pathway to net zero with a bank if you're, if you're continuing to fund fossil fuel expansion. It, it's, it's just, it, it just doesn't work. Um, and it's down to the banks to understand where the risk is uh, that they're facing. And they could be funding uh, operations that may not actually be in a position to serve the, the interest and ultimately the, the repayment, um, unless it's a very quick series of turnovers. And But we heard this idea back in 07, 08, that you can quickly sell these this exposure um, and... Uh, you know, the mortgage-backed securities. And we're in a similar position with fossil fuel finance. People say, oh, don't worry, Mark, they, they, we roll this over after two or three years and exactly the same in 07 or 08 and, and until you find out that nobody actually wants to buy it mm. um, and no one else wants to refinance it and you, you, end, you end up in a very serious contraction uh, in the banking system. So central banks should be stepping in. And um, there's one area, you, you're probably familiar with reserves-based lending, where the banks mm. work out what your reserves are, and they'll lend to you against the value of your reserves based on the current oil price. And we're going to have to completely rewrite all those rules. Uh, certainly, central banks should be stepping in there to do that. Um, but it's not just that. It's, not, it's the bond markets. I don't think there should be any more bond issuance for fossil fuels to finance fossil fuel expansion, if we're serious about 1.5. And the banks doing bond issuance for, for coal, oil and gas, um, they're going to come under increasing scrutiny from their own shareholders about this. Um, and one thing that I feel very strongly about, there's been 2,500 coal, oil and gas initial public offerings, IPOs and second replacements uh, in the last 10 years, of which just actually for, for interest, they on average lost half their money, but they raised $700 billion. Um, so I think that there should be a permanent plan on new um, fossil fuel related IPOs uh, in, in the markets. And, and the reason for that is to protect the integrity of the markets. We're exposing too much risk within, within the markets themselves, certainly high carbon sectors or, or, or stock markets of which Canada is one. Um, and we should be gently 
releasing the pressure that's building up in the bond markets and the equity markets exposed to fossil fuels and adding more fossil fuel companies to the Canadian and the Toronto exchange uh, is, I think, a mugs game. And, and, and central bankers should be very wary of, uh, of, of um, the financial markets being used in this way. At the same time, I've been hearing uh, uh, some banks talk about how they'll be, you know, using this green push to help uh, fossil fuel companies green their assets, help them cap their emissions. Uh, but we're talking scope one and scope two here. There's no mention yeah, of scope that, three. What do we do about scope three? I mean, I mean, I worked as an as an analyst, fund manager for, for twenty years before setting up Carbon Tracker, and and they must they must take the average analysts who working in a fund management company for fools if they think they're not going to spot that game mm. um, and this is that and the same comes for carbon capture and storage and and nature-based solutions is is companies cannot cover their scope three emissions you know the burnt the, the co2 from the sale of their products um with, with these offsets uh, um, actually we need the offsets of course but we need it for the really challenging difficult to abate sectors cement steel aviation and so on and it's a and it's it's an end game we problem in 2040 when we're probably going to have some kind of overshoot and we're going to be needing a lot of that not not to continue burning fossil fuels today because we don't need to i mean you i mean the interesting thing i'm not the first to say this but we're the first generation in human history um since you know the neanderthals where we don't have to burn something to move from A to B or to heat our home or to cook. We're the first generation in human history where we can do all of that with simply with electrons, mm. um, cooking and, you know, and, 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 and transportation. I mean, and uh, so we need to be getting off of fossil fuels very quickly. And, and what we're seeing is around Europe, certainly, and we'll see this in the US, is, is uh, bringing forward a ban on the sale of the internal combustion engine mm. from 2035 to 2030. Some cities will do bring the ban to 2025. Um, and yesterday we saw the announcement from, was it Nissan, $17 billion into retrofitting and building an electric vehicle system where predominant, most, the majority of car sales for them will be electric or, and certainly hybrid. Uh, so these, everyone's saying, oh, you know, demand's going up. I, I think certainly in places like China and India, um, uh, we'll be leapfrogging to an electric-based transportation system, and we just won't be needing all these fossil fuels. And the banks that keep lending in the expectation that growth will come, well, well we'll be facing these stranded assets. Mm. Mark, we've only got about a minute and a half left with you. I wish we could chat all day. Uh, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing some kind of final impressions you had, A, of, of, of your experience at uh, COP26. Were you, did it give you any hope at all? And what, and what hope do you have that we can slash our emissions by 45% by 2030 globally? So I've been to a lot of COPs and this one had, this one had the feeling of a two week um, investment conference. Or it felt like, you know, the Globe conference that happens in Vancouver. It felt like that, but going on for two weeks with a lot of business, a lot of investors. And and uh, even more so than Paris. And the UK government seemed to be treating it almost like a trade show. And there were so many banks competing to get you to come to their events every single day for two weeks. And there was one. I don't even, I think it's probably rather appalling, actually, that I had a champagne tower. <laughs> so in champagne and and what and and you could look at that really skeptically going well this was the cop to talk about saving the planet but it was also the cop where business came in and we're, we're competing saying look we're going to run faster than government and we've got a lot of solutions to bring to the table we're going to deploy a lot of capital into clean technology and renewables and everyone you know like a peacock just trying to show off how good they are um and i see that as rather healthy but everyone has to be skeptical about that uh, but I also see it slightly healthy, uh, very healthy, actually, um, because we need the private sector running faster than government, for sure. So that came across as COP. Um, and announcements around methane reduction, announcements around the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, talking about fossil fuels, they were all the real positives for me um, to be there. Um, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I tweet a lot about this. I'm at Campanale Mark in my Twitter handle, where I get to 
kind of reflect on a lot of this stuff. And Carbon Tracker's analysis, is, as you probably know, carbontracker.org, it's all freely available because we're philanthropically funded. And we talk a lot about this and we analyze about uh, we analyze these issues. Um, do, I, do I face 2022 with, with hope? Yes, because the government's decided to almost all bring it back again in 2022 at the, at the Egypt, Egyptian COP and almost like repeat this year's COP um, because of the urgency of dealing with the climate crisis. And, and, and that shows, I think, the level of commitment by governments to want to deal with this properly. And of course, we'll have one year on from GFANS. We'll be able to see what GFANS actually does in reality and what the banks are doing in reality. Mark, I would like to thank you so much for your time yes. today and sharing your insights with us. I wish we had more time, but that well, as thanks. well as a limited uh, resource. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> I mean, once you get me going, it's difficult to stop, isn't it? <laughs> Next time we will request the so full two hours with you, for sure. I hope some of sure. that was interesting. <laughs> Lovely to be on. Thank you very much. And thank you to our audience for joining us today.